to be is alone with Jesus. Hallelujah. Enjoy this. Worship with us.
Can somebody say amen to that? Hallelujah. Just so wonderful to spend time with the Lord, spend time in his word and receive all of his goodness, receive revelation from his love and his word and his power. I just want to encourage you, man, make it a goal this year. You're going to spend more time in God's loving word than you've ever spent before. Can you shout amen? It is so amazing. It'll transform your life. Amen. Come on, let's shout about the faithfulness of God this morning. Someone, someone say hello. Hallelujah. Sing it out. This I'll testify till I see it with my eyes that your word is true, my God. You cannot lie. Oh, I wouldn't despair unless I had believed. I see your goodness. Your words and your mercy will follow.
somebody give him a shout hallelujah amen hallelujah shout out he's faithful amen
And your unfailing love surrounds us. We put our hope in you alone. With your favor, you have crowned us. Cause your love remains above everything. One more time, we put our hope in you. We put our hope in you. We trust your holy name. We trust your holy name. Yes, Jesus. Come on, give him a big shout. Hallelujah. Still and know that I am God. Be still and know you're God. Come on, Lord, speaking to us this morning. I am the Lord, your great reward. And know your God standing still before you now, resting in your awesome heart. Humble with our hearts, we bow still before you now. 
sing this with me like this. I'm still and I know that you are my God. I'm still and I know you are God. You are the Lord. You are the Lord, my great reward, be still, I'm still, and I know you are God. I just want to say something real quick here. I just want to encourage you right now. I know that some of you are going through some really tough times just by talking to some of you and just by knowing in general life and what happens sometimes how the enemy is so evil and tries to attack us and tries to destroy us and tries to hurt our family our loved ones so i just want to encourage you this morning with this song we just are singing let's sing it again that just i want you to just be still and know beyond a shadow of doubt that he is your god he is the lord your great reward I want you to stand still. Let's sing it again, but I really want you to focus in. Don't think about your problem, but focus in on the fact that he is going to take care of everything. You're going to trust in him no matter what. Amen? You're going to do that with me? Come on, I'm going to do it myself. I'm still and I know <laughs> that you are God. I'm going to be still, Lord. I'm still, and I know you are God. Don't be anxious. Don't get into fear. Because you are the Lord. You're my great reward. Say you are God. You are God. You are God. Hallelujah. You're my God. Oh, yes, you are. You're my God. Come on and worship Him. You're my God, Lord. And your word is true, Jesus. Oh, yes, you are, my God. Nothing can stand against your word, Lord. You're my God. Hallelujah. I'm still, I'm still, and I know that you are my God. I'm still, and I know, yes, I know, you are Bye.
tonight. Can you say amen to that? Come on. Come on, give it all to him. Give him a big shout of praise. Oh. the f- 
Somebody shout hallelujah. I want to hear a big shout today. Come on now. Woo, that's it. All right. Woo. Amen. All right. God bless all of you. Just give somebody a hug, handshake, bump, whatever you're comfortable with, and you can be seated. Of course I love it. It's, there's a lot of really good fellowship and the courses are all really foundational, which is something that being one year in the Lord is really nice to have. Thank you. I love Karis Bible College. It has changed my life. It is just the best thing that's ever happened to me. I didn't think I could do it. At my age, I didn't think I would be able to memorize or pass tests. But God has helped me all the way. I have learned the word. It now flows out of me rather than trying to get into me. And God has just, just changed me forever. I did my first year of Karis at an extension school out in California. And then uh, from there, that school ended up closing. But um, so I've been half done for a while. But eventually the Lord brought me out here to, to Arizona, Phoenix, to 
finished up my uh, second year out here, which I just did last year and graduated. Just a continuation of just great teaching and pouring in. And it's just been a tremendous blessing. I love, I love Karis, I love Andrew Womack Ministries. My favorite teacher has got to be Andrew. Wendell Parr is a nice second. I guess I have to go with everybody else and say Barry Bennett. <laughs> so my favorite teachers, it's really hard to pick because I love them all. Andrew Womack has to be my top, but I love Greg Moore, Barry Bennett, uh, Lawson Purdue definitely with his, with his uh, unique way of delivery. Um, Wendell, Wendell is awesome. They're all great. They're all, you can't go wrong with any of the teachers of Karis. You need to come. Hey guys. Come to the Discover Karis meeting after the second session today. Today, immediately after the first session. Second session, third session. <laughs> I said it wrong, but that's, that's all you're getting. Yeah. Today at noon, see you there. Be there, be square. Praise the Lord. Well, as the video said, we've got a Karis interest meeting coming up right after the morning meetings. It'll be like at 1210 or something. And I would like to encourage all of you to attend that. Um, I tell you that we've made it so that you, anybody can take advantage of this. Even if you've got a job, even if you live someplace else, you can do it by correspondence. We've got eCaris. They'll be explaining all of these different ways to you. And uh, so please take advantage of that. I tell you, it's been awesome to have uh, all of you here, but to have the Lord with us and touching people, have the Holy Spirit touching people. We've now had uh, 76 people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and um, six people receive salvation. We've had irritable bowel syndrome healed, heart palpitations, asthma, pelvis joint pain, uh, fibroid tumors, arthritis, vocal cord issues, uh, COVID side effects, uh, shoulder pain, back pain. Here's a testimony about uh, the fibroid tumors. It says Andrew called out female issues. You know, one time I was in a service and a guy said, there's somebody here with female issues. And then he goes, I perceive it's a woman. <laughs> and I thought it could be a man. But anyway, I called out that somebody had female issues and it says a woman responded to had fibroid tumor that enlarged her stomach. After the prayer ministers prayed, the tumor visibly shrunk and her pants were loose. Man, that's awesome. And a lady with pain, level seven on the left side, prayed and the pain left. Now she was praising God. And here's another one with the shoulder pain gone. So I tell you, it's just awesome. You know, it's wonderful to talk about the Lord, but it's great to have the Lord with us and to see his effect on people and, and the way that he changes people's lives. I tell you, that's just awesome. We've had a great time. How many of you were not here last night? You didn't hear uh, Bishop E.W. Jackson. Could I see your hand? Well, quite a few of you, but man, I know that those of you that were here were blessed. This morning, we're going to let uh, Bishop have two sessions in a row because he missed yesterday morning and uh, his plane hadn't arrived. And so we're going to give him two sessions this morning and then I'll speak this afternoon at two o'clock. Let me just quickly give away some things, remind you that we've got a lot of material out there. I've got over 200,000 hours of free material on our website and uh, you can get that, but we brought a lot of material with us. I'd encourage you to check it out. This one is entitled How to Find, Follow and Fulfill God's Will. Actually, this is three separate teachings that I did that have been combined into one. You know, how to find God's will is important, but then you have to learn how to follow the Lord and then to finish your course is really amazing. There's a lot of people that get started and never cross the finish line. They get, uh, they fall out by the way. And this is just an all encompassing thing about how to find, follow and fulfill God's will. And this is literally what God used to get me started. I knew that God had a purpose for my life. I didn't know what it was. And when he showed me Romans 12, one and two, that changed my life. 
And so this is a great, great teaching. I'll let uh, Matt give this to somebody that looks like you don't have a clue where to go or how to get there. <laughs> and this is one of our DVDs of our musicals. Some of you don't know this, but we have Broadway quality musicals that we put on. And I mean, they really are. Uh, I know that a lot of times when you say Christian and musical in the same sentence, it doesn't seem to fit. And usually they're real poor, but these people have been offered millions of dollars to go put these broadcast, I mean, these uh, productions on Broadway, and yet they just feel called to be a part of what we're doing, and it is excellent. So we've got David, we've got uh, God with us, we've got the Heart of Christmas. Do we have any others that are on video? In God We Trust, and uh, we perform these at least three or four a year. Matter of fact, this coming summer, Summer Family Bible Conference, we will be doing a special one. What are we doing on July the 4th? In God We Trust. And this, okay, David is in April of the 8th through the 10th. In God We Trust is at our Summer Family Bible Conference. Uh, Bishop Jackson's going to be speaking there again. And uh, it's just a special time. So anyway, these are really good. I'll let Matt give this to somebody that would like a DVD of a musical. And then uh, here's one of our healing journeys. We have, I think, seven or, well, we must have eight because this is volume eight. <laughs> and uh, we have, I think, five testimonies on each one. So that's 40 testimonies of people that were raised from the dead, multiple sclerosis healed, Down syndrome healed, um, man, just everything you can imagine, Crohn's disease, uh, all kinds of things. And so anyway, this is a great, great deal. This has five testimonies on here. This one has Vanya, who is healed of cancer, and she got healed of cancer watching our uh, musicals. That's how she got healed. She lives in uh, Houston, and she watched it just nonstop and got healed. Now, Michael is a young man who uh, had food allergies and asthma and was healed. Jeremiah Klaus was healed of multiple sclerosis, was on his deathbed and raised up. Uh, Colleen is a uh, businesswoman. She works for us and she was healed of incurable back pain. And Allison Rolla, she had uh, alpecia. And I remember when she came to my meetings in Charlotte, and she had no hair anywhere on her body. She could have no home, no eyebrows, no hair. And she had been terrorized by this her whole life. And I prayed with her and the next morning, her hair was a quarter of an inch long. And now she's got long hair. It's a great, great testimony. So give that to somebody who looks like they need encouragement in their healing. And this is a book that I wrote about Don't Limit God based on Psalm 78, 41. God spoke this to me January the 31st, 2002. And as far as change outwardly, it's the second most important encounter I ever had with God. And most of us are limiting God and don't even realize it. I tell about how God spoke to me and what it's done. And you know, I just made television programs that you won't see for another uh, couple of months or no, they'll be at the end of this month, but I'm now talking about Don't Limit God 20 years later. And it is phenomenal. When God spoke this to me, I had 23 employees. Now we have 987 employees. We covered 2% of the U.S. population on television when God spoke to me. Now we covered, they just updated it, 4.2 billion people can see my program on a daily basis. And just, I mean, on and on you could go. Our assets went from $14,000 uh, to now we have like $120 million worth of assets. We've built in the last 10 years, $120 million worth of buildings and stuff. And I'm starting in uh, April more. So anyway, I'm just saying those things to say that man, God has blessed us. And I believe that God is wanting to do more in every person's life than what you are experiencing. And I promise you, this will challenge you. So I'll let Matt give that to somebody that looks like you need to be challenged. <laughs> Matt's a blessing. Praise God. 
And also, uh, we've got the uh, David uh, musical on CD here, just the audio portion of it. And uh, this is really good. The music is awesome. I tell you what, it's great. And I do have to say that Jamie is one of the stars in all of these musicals. And I know that... And I know that many people think, oh man, it's one of those things where you put your own family in there and it's just, that really decreases the quality. You'll be surprised. She really is awesome. She is a blessing. Praise God. So if you didn't hear uh, Bishop E.W. last night, man, you're in for a blessing this morning. He pastors in Virginia and uh, he's just a blessing. We've been good friends now for a number of years and um, we're looking forward to what God has for us. He's gonna have two sessions. We're gonna take a break somewhere around 1030 and have a 20 minute break and then we'll have a second session. But let's welcome back uh, Bishop E.W. Jackson as he comes to share with us. Praise the Lord. I think they like you, brother. Praise God. We love you. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Andrew. And thank you all uh, to you and Jamie. Thank you all for the hospitality and the honor of having an opportunity to share in your ministry. As I said last night, my wife and I are, are, are grateful to God to be partners with Andrew Walmack Ministries. Uh, and it speaks so much into our lives as well. So I know it will speak into yours. And I'm convinced of this, that partnership does indeed allow you to tap into the anointing that has produced all that Andrew is experiencing. Amen. And so every one of us needs that. Amen. Because God wants to expand the influence in each of our lives. And by plugging into somebody that God is flowing through like that, you enhance your own ministry. It certainly has enhanced mine. I think I shared last night, we have people visiting my church who drive for hours because they saw me on Andrew Warwick Ministries. They want to come meet me in person. So, so it's been a tremendous blessing to me and my wife. And I know it will be a tremendous blessing to you as well as you all continue to partner uh, with this great ministry. Uh, well, look... Folks, thank you so much again for being receptive. You know, it's sometimes it's hard to preach in some places, Andrew, as you know, because you're plowing some very hard ground. And sometimes it's easy to preach because the ground has already been dug up and furrowed and people are hungry for the word of God. And that's the case here. So it really is a pleasure to preach here and to be received so warmly by all of you all. Remind you, we do have a table outside with some books and materials on it. And the best way to plug into our ministry rather than giving you a bunch of things is to get our app. There's the E.W. Jackson app. You can get it on the Apple Store or the Google Play Store. And it'll plug you into Stand. It'll plug you into our church. It'll plug you into the other activities, uh, things that we do. We've got a podcast that's on every morning called Wisdom Awakening. And then we've got... Um, uh, radio programs on 1 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday all, also, which is with American Family Radio. Um, and we are reaching people all over the country, 200 radio stations across the country. And so you can plug into all of that through the app and that'll kind of allow you to go and pick and choose uh, where you want to uh, give your attention. So, so I think that, that makes things a lot simpler. All right, well, praise God. Last night, we talked about how important, absolutely important it is to understand who we are, that we are the remnant, and that God said Israel would have become as Sodom and Gomorrah had it, there not been a very small remnant. You know, I'm convinced of this. God doesn't need a majority. He needs, he needs a committed minority. He needs a committed group of people. Did you all know that that communists write to all of their devotees that they don't need to take over a whole society. They say that if we can get 10% that are willing to stand up for communist principles, we'll take over the whole country. And we as Christians have got to understand that we are far more than that. The problem is that we have simply not taken a stand the way we need to. And so many have hidden and, and ducked and bobbed and weaved to try to avoid what they consider to be controversy. I've said to many pastors across the country, the controversy is coming to you. You don't have to go find it. 
It's coming through your church door. It's coming into your house. It's coming into your child's education. And the decision you have to make is whether you're going to let it roll over you or whether you're going to take a stand. And we're going to take a stand. Amen. <laughs> we're going to take a stand. That's what my organization, the acronym for staying true to America's national destiny is STAND. Because I believe that that's what God has called us to do. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having have put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Well, today I want to talk from a slightly different subject out of Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. I alluded to it last night, which says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And I want to pose a question to you today. What will you do with the gift? What will you do with the gift? If you ever have an opportunity to visit my home, you will find in one of our bedrooms a small desk. Um, it's a desk suitable for a child. I've had that desk for now close to 58 years. It was a gift to me when I was 12 years old. It's not made of any special materials. The workmanship is not particularly good. My wife and I just had it refurbished not too long ago so that the drawers would work and it wouldn't fall apart. But if you came into my home looking to take something of value, there are a whole lot of things worth a lot more money that I would tell you, take that, but don't take that desk. Now, why is that desk so important? Well, it's not simply the desk. It's who gave it to me. Some of you know my story. I was born into poverty, a mother and father who were breaking up at the time I was born. And from birth, almost, I was shuttled around from one foster home to another. At the age of 14 months old, I was placed in the foster home of Willie and Rebecca Molette. And they raised me from 14 months old until the time I was 10. But I grew up with a cancerous resentment. And that resentment was, why aren't my mother and father taking care of me? Why am I living in foster care? And the more mature I became, the more that gnawed at me. And by the time of my pre-adolescent years, I was in full-blown rebellion. My foster parents couldn't tell me anything. They would try to punish me and I would run away, go find a friend to hide with and lie to them, lie to their parents and say, my parents asked if I could stay here. They would go on a search trying to figure out where I was. My mother was a Jehovah's Witness. I saw her very rarely. And believe it or not, when I saw her, tended to be passing by some liquor store or establishment where she was standing up, holding up Watchtower and Awake magazines. And you know, I, 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 it, it's painful to say this, but when I was sitting in a car outside of one of those places, I don't remember a single time which my mother ever left her post to, came and, to come and speak to me. By the time I was nine years old, I was a member of a gang and we were committing petty crimes. The kinds of things that at an older age would have gotten us locked up. We were going up on people's porches, robbing pocketbooks. We were finding milk trucks that the milkman had walked away from and going in and taking what money we could find in the compartments. We were going into establishments that we thought we could rob without confrontation because we were still young. But I was on my way to a very, very unhappy conclusion in my life. The people that we admired in Chester, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, we're not doctors, lawyers, not scholars. They were the thugs, the people who had gone to prison and come out. 
They were our heroes. When they walked down the street, we looked upon them admiringly. One day we can be like them. One day we will go to jail and we'll come out and people will respect us. That's the pathology into which I entered. And my foster parents were loving and dear people, but they simply didn't understand what I was going through and they couldn't control me. I saw my mother rarely, but my father did visit from time to time. And one day, still get emotional talking about it, standing on a street corner in Chester, Pennsylvania with my gang around me, my father pulled up. I recognized him about 75 feet and pointed at me and said, come here. I walked over, hey dad. And my father said to me very gravely, he said, son, you always say you want to come live with me. You still want that? I said, yeah, dad, absolutely, yes. He said, get in. I got in the car. We were only a couple of blocks from the foster home I lived in. We drove down and he walked in and he said, I will never forget it. He said, Miss Beck, and she said, hey, Bill. That's what everybody called him. My father's name was William Jackson. Hey, Bill. And he said, I'm here to take my son. And she was kind of like, she wasn't quite sure what he meant. And he said, I'm taking my son to live with me. And she became hysterical. I mean, she raised me from 14 months old. I was her baby. And she said, well, give me, we, we need to go to the courts and we need to go to social services. My father said, it doesn't matter who you go to. This is the way it's going to be. He said, because if I don't take him, we're going to lose him because he was watching and he saw what was going on and realized that if somebody didn't step in, I was on my way to jail or an early death on the streets. We were already having gang fights. We just weren't using guns yet, but that's where it was going because they were, they were even at that young age, believe it or not, they were vicious. And she just cried and, and wept and she said, well, give me a chance to pack his stuff up and give me a week to get him ready. And my father said, I don't have the, a week to do it. He said, he's going with me now. And anything you've got, I'll come back and pick up later. And we walked out the door and my life changed overnight. Overnight. I'll never forget it. My father took me into his a little apartment that he lived in, sat me down. He said, son, you're with me now. I'm your father and I'm going to take care of you. He said, and every day with me can be like a day of heaven on earth or every day I will tear your behind all to pieces. <laughs> and coding. And you know what I found out? He meant it. <laughs> and he would enforce what he said. But look, I went from being a gang member that the day before to no longer having any association with any gang after that. I went from being an F student in fifth grade who almost got kept back because I remember the conference of my foster mother with my fifth grade teacher about how little I'd learned because I rarely went to school. I went when I felt like it or when there was nothing else for us to do. Other than that, I hung out in the street with my boys. And I went from being an F student in fifth grade to an A student in sixth grade. People ask how in the world did you end up at Harvard Law School? And I say, other than the grace of God, it was my beloved father who taught me, son, you are going to make something of yourself. I don't want any excuses. You're gonna to have to work for it. Nobody owes you anything. God has given you gifts and talents and abilities and you're gonna put them to use and you're gonna become somebody better, do better in life than I've done. My father had a sixth grade education, was a, a welder in Sunship Building and Dry Dock Company. Imagine what he felt to watch his son graduate summa cum laude with a degree, Phi Beta Kappa, and then go on and graduate from Harvard Law School. But my brothers and sisters, that's the grace of God and that's what America will produce if people will get out of the way and let folks pursue their God-given gifts and talents and abilities. My first executive desk was given to me by that daddy. And if you try to take that desk, you're going to have to fight me. 
But it's not because of the desk. It's because of the Father who gave it to me. My brothers and sisters, our Heavenly Father has placed us in the United States of America where we have the freedom and the opportunity to do the things that have been a part of my life. And that's why if you start messing with my country, you're getting on the fighting side of me. Because my Heavenly Father gave me this nation as a place to fulfill His God-given talents and abilities that He put in my life. Now that gift is in a safe place. And in some sense, it is guarded. Our country is in not so safe a place right now. Because so many who've gone before us have not, so many Christians who've gone before us have not guarded this gift. You know, we've got to teach Christians that you are not here by accident. That this is not, I saw an interview with some kids and they were asking them about the Olympics. These were college students. They were asking them, so are you rooting for the American team in the Olympics? And the, the kids gave this kind of answer. I'm not rooting for a team just because they come from some, the same place I happen to live in. They had no deeper understanding of their presence here than it just happens to be the place I live in. And for us as Christians, we ought to have a theology of place. We ought to know that God has worked this out for us. That God has put us here for God's purposes. We often hear this rhetoric that, well, you know, America's stolen. We, we stole the land. And, 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 and to, to tell you the truth, technically, there's nobody on this continent, including Native Americans who are truly native to this continent. Y'all realize the Native Americans are of Asian ancestry. They, most theorize, they walked across the Beringer, across that what's called the, often called, the, referred to as the Bering Strait, for all, all the way from Asia across into Alaska, and then over the generations moved down the coast. So when people talk about stealing the land, it's ridiculous. I mean, the fact of the matter is, everybody on this continent ultimately came from somewhere else. And I really believe that God had a plan for all of us who are here. Whether we're British ancestry or African ancestry or German or Irish or Italian or Hispanic or Asian or, 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 or Native American as we like to refer to it. That we've all come from somewhere else. You know, we're like Abraham. God summoned us from a far off land and placed us in this land. I really believe to be a witness to him that the word of God says that we might seek the Lord. No nation has been more responsible for the propagation of the gospel around the world than the United States of America. Every single one of us is here by divine appointment. And the myth that somehow the world would have been so much better off if the first settlers Columbus, the, the, the Jamestown settlement, um, the, the Mayflower, if, if they just never come here, the world would be a better place. The fact of the matter is that America has been more responsible than any other nation for raising the standard of the world. People live better all over the world because the United States of America exists. America, and this is just a smattering, America invented the airplane, air conditioning, hearing aids, cardiac fibrillators, traffic lights, microwave ovens, lasers, GPS, well, I like to refer to as Gertrude Penelope Smith, but you know, <laughs> chemotherapy, emails, mobile phones, personal computers, the internet, and on and on and on it goes. We are 4.25% of the population of the world. We produce over half the patents and inventions that the world has ever seen. How does 4% of the population do that? The grace of Almighty God and the freedom to pursue our God-given dreams. Would, would any of us have been better off if our ancestors had never come here? You know, Europe, 
has gone into full-blown godless secularism. I mean, here's just one example. In 2012, a landmark case before the European Union Court, which was an appeal from the, the country of Sweden, considering whether leaflets could be distributed to college students, which said that homosexuality is morally destructive of society. The court convicted those who handed out those leaflets, sentenced them to prison and fines and probation. That's the European Union. That represents almost all of Europe today. Europe has gone into full-blown secularism. Ireland right now has one of the, most, the, the stiffest COVID restrictions in the world. Is there anybody who thinks that somehow if my ancestors had not left where they are and stayed and I were still there, all life would be so much better. There's not a single American who believes that. I mean, well, what about, what about, well, Bishop, that, that's easy to say, but what about Africans? Surely Americans of African descent would have been better off. Well, first of all, if you're thinking about slavery, all it means is that they would have been slaves in Africa instead of slaves in America or Europe. Because the people who were sold into slavery in Africa were generally people who were already slaves to African tribes and nations there. Oh, you won't learn that in most colleges and public schools, but it's the truth. And look, one-fifth of the people living in Africa today are malnourished. It's the highest rate of malnourishment in the world. More than 30% of African children suffer from growth disorders, such as stunting due to chronic malnutrition. In sub-Saharan Africa, which is where most of the slaves came from, one in 11 children dies today by their fifth birthday. The highest infant mortality rate in the world is in Africa, in Ethiopia and Nigeria and Kenya leading the way. 59 million children in Africa between the ages of 5 and 17 have to work instead of going to school to keep their families from starving. Anybody look at me and think, oh, wouldn't it have been so much better, Bishop Jackson, if your ancestors had never been taken from Africa? I say, you've got to be a fool. <laughs> you know, I get people mad sometimes when I say this. I say, I don't care how my ancestors got here. I'm just glad that they got here. Because they got here, I'm here. I was born a citizen to the freest nation in the history of mankind. I'm sure you all know this history, but there was a movement because of course the founding fathers and those who came after them with this large slave class, 90% of, of, of people of African ancestry lived in the South and, and most of those were slaves. Most of the free folks, of course, lived in the North, although there was a free black population in the South as well. But they were concerned about this slave population, and many of them mused whether the sudden freeing of the slaves was going to lead to some kind of race war, uh, whether they would rise up in vengeance and, and you'd end up having to kill a bunch of people just trying to get things under control. And they were grappling with, if, if, if freedom were to happen, what would it ultimately look like? What, how, how would it ultimately work out? As I said last night, one American was murdered and killed in, in the Civil War for every six slaves that were freed. It ultimately cost blood and treasure to end that institution. So many posited maybe it would be better to repatriate them, send them back to the continent from which they came, and that would, that would take care of this. And we wouldn't have this population of people who have been so abused and mistreated that they might want to rise up and create a, an internal war in our country. In 1831, black people from America, free black people, held the first national convention of free people of color. Now that was before slavery ended, 1831. At that, con at that convention, they passed a resolution condemning recolonization as a movement, theorizing even though slavery was wrong, it was better to keep black people here until slavery was ended than to repatriate them. And this is what the resolution said, quote, America is our home and this is our country. Beneath its sod lie the bones of our fathers. Here we were born, and here we will die. 
And that is why my brothers and sisters, I say to people all over this nation, I am not an African American, I am an American. I am an American. Our ancestors may have come over here on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. And I'm not gonna sit by while people try to sink this boat. We're gonna float this baby all the way into its destiny before God. God expects us to treasure every gift he's given us. Andrew Karras is a treasure. And we're supposed to treasure it as a gift from Almighty God. My brothers and sisters, whatever God has imbued you with, because we're all imbued in some different ways. But God expects you to treasure the gift that he's given you. I've been preaching for, for nearly 40 years, and there's never a moment I get up before people that I don't say to God, God, I can't do this without you. I can't do it without you. I know you've given me a gift, but I'm not leaning on the gift, I'm leaning on the giver. So Lord God, put your words in my mouth. Show me what you want me to say. Help me to say it the way you want me to say it. I treasure the gift because I know it's God who gave me the gift. What gifts has God given you? And how are you using them? Are you treasuring them? Are you hiding them? This country is one of those gifts, maybe one of the greatest ever given to any people. And we ought to treasure it. It's our nation. And what we do ought to be reflective of the fact that we know this place is unique. I shared last night, Revelation 5, 9, uh, 5, 9 talks about the kingdom of God being made up of every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. Said so there's no other nation that reflects that better than the United States of America. And does anybody really believe that God sits on the throne and one day looked up and saw the United States of America arising as this great behemoth and said, oh, wow, there's a shocker. Never expected that. <laughs> ben Franklin said, a nation cannot rise without his aid. And my brothers and sisters, with all the condemnation you hear of our country, America's a white supremacist country, America's systemically racist, you don't become the greatest nation on earth by doing everything wrong. Because if that's the case, then the Bible is a lie because the Bible says righteousness exalts a nation. You don't become the leading nation of the world by simply sinning. Somebody's doing something right. And let me tell you what we've done right throughout our history. Throughout our history, in spite of whatever mistakes we might have made as a nation, there were people on their knees before God in behalf of this country crying out to him, asking God to keep us and make us a nation whose God is the Lord. That's been the saving grace of the United States of America. We are not genetically better people. It's that the grace of Almighty God has been upon us because we founded this nation on the principle that God exists and that he is the author of our existence and that our rights and freedoms come from him. No other nation's been founded on those principles. <laughs> Glory to God, was, were our founding fathers perfect? No. Are you? Neither am I. Nobody is. The only perfect person who ever walked the face of the earth was Jesus Christ. And everybody is born into their circumstance. And we as Christians, better than anybody else are able to transcend the circumstances of our lives. I just told you what my background is. God allowed me to transcend those circumstances. But the circumstances themselves were not my choosing. Look, I, I, I rarely share this, but I'm led of the Spirit to share this with you. Although I was saved, I was a child of the 60s. And I came into salvation and back to the church because I was raised uh, in the church. My foster parents took me to church. It didn't take, but they took me. <laughs> but God sowed some things into my life that came back to me. But so I brought a lot of that racial thinking into Christianity with me, but I wasn't even conscious of it. And I was standing in the pulpit one time after I'd become a pastor 
and just talking to the congregation. And after the, the service, a mixed couple came up to me and said, Pastor, you really hurt us. And I said, what? Because, see, folks, honestly, I didn't know what they were talking about. They said, you really hurt us. I said, really, what did I say? And they repeated to me some things I'd said about race. And when they did, I was convicted. I realized that even though I'm a Christian and even though I love God and even though I know I'm supposed to look at people, I had brought a lot of the culture of my time into my Christian life. And I made it, I apologized to them and repented and asked their forgiveness and made a commitment to God. I said, Lord, I will never again use your pulpit to espouse any kind of racial doctrine, any kind of idea about people based on the color of their skin. And that was when God spoke to me and told me, son, people make a whole lot of race, but I want you to let people know it's irrelevant in my sight. It's irrelevant. And that's when God began to minister to me that he raised this nation up to be a model to the world. And it's only faith in God that has made it possible for us to make the progress that we are making. And when we reject that, as so many are trying to get us to do, the progress ends. America doesn't work without God. Progressivism is not progressive at all because it's based on a godless worldview. And the future of America lies only in understanding that we owe everything to Almighty God. And without him, America will become a historical footnote on the dung heap of other failed empires. But with him, America's future is bright. There's, listen, you know, on the way here, I, had, I got delayed, not because of a plane problem with the airplane, but because the runway lights wouldn't come on. The pilot came out and said, ladies and gentlemen, I've been flying for 35 years. I've never seen a plane not able to take off because we couldn't get the runway lights to move. And you know, God really spoke to me in that. You know what he said? Son, my people are the runway lights for the United States of America. And if the lights aren't turned on, America can't take off. If we want a bright future, my brothers and sisters, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, we need to listen to those Americans, particularly those Christians who've come from other places escaping tyranny and totalitarianism. I'm, I'm sure some of you know about Virginia Rodan. And Virginia was... Uh, 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 raised up in, in uh, Ceausescu's Romania. Ceausescu was a brutal anti-Christian communist dictator and he was vicious. And she got saved in Romania and began to try to preach the gospel and got persecuted for it. They put her in prison. They beat her. They tortured her. A little five foot woman. They did everything they could to her. But she, she just kept trusting God and would not quit. Finally went to law school, got a degree, and started trying to sue the Ceausescu regime. <laughs> Finally, one day, sitting in her office, a man walked in, pulled out a pistol, and st stuck it in her face and told her, I've been sent to assassinate you. And she said for a second she froze, but she heard the Lord say to her, witness to him and give him the gospel. Said and she said, well, before you do, let me just ask you, have you ever heard that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Have you ever heard that he loves you and, and paid the price for you? She said, when she said that, the man, he, he then froze. Said his eyes got big. She said, and, and God said, start quoting scripture to him. Since he started quoting the word of God, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Said the man started listening and then took the gun and stuck it back in his pocket. And she said, would you like to get saved? Her assassin. And he said, I think I would. The man got saved and then started helping her and wrote a chapter in her book, Save My, I Save My Assassin.
He wrote a chapter in the book. My brothers and sisters, when the people of God stand up with the gospel of truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, all the demons in hell can't stop us, can't put us down, can't slow us down. We are destined for victory through Christ Jesus. Because look, it, it is not, we have a beautiful country, but it's not the, the, the expanse of the Atlantic or the Pacific. It's not, it's not the glory of Pikes Peak. It's not the beauty of the Teton Mountains. It, it's not the Grand Canyon. It, it's not all the wonderful sights that this country has as beautiful as they are. It's the people. It's the people. When we say we love our country, what we ought to be saying is, we love this great nation that offers so much to so many people. And we want to perpetuate that. That's why God created, he didn't create us for America, he created America for us. And we have got to love people and, and, and treasure people. When we treasure the gift of America, it means we treasure the people that God put here because we are stewards of all that makes it possible for them to fulfill their God-given destiny. My brothers and sisters, that love can't stop based on the color of people's skin. It can't stop based on gender and all these other things that people are using in the world today to try to divide us. It's got to be the love of God that extends to all. God so loved the world, that means everybody. And our love for this country means love for God's people, love for all of us. And the desire to see all of us become everything that God wants us to be. You know, Jesus looked at Israel and saw Israel scattered as sheep without a shepherd. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And I hear God saying, America, America, how I formed you together and brought you together and want to gather together as a chick gathers her hands under her wings, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you don't want me. And remember what he said, the grave warning he gave, he said, see, Israel, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And my prayer is, oh God, Look upon this country and the millions across it who are saying, Lord, we honor your presence. We desire your presence. We say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Don't leave our house desolate. Lord God, bring an awakening to America. Cause the people to rise up and recognize that America needs God more than anything else. And if we will stand up and speak up and hold up the bloodstained banner, I know that God will not not fail us. Like Andrew, God spoke to me and said, the awakening has already begun, my brothers and sisters. It's already begun. Paul said, my desire for Israel is that she might be saved. Our desire for America is that she might be saved. The beauty of our environment is wonderful, but the salvation of our people is what we're really after. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that is why I, I, I really get viscerally angry when I see people denigrate the American flag, when I see people refusing to stand up for it and respect it, because my brothers and sisters, it's not about the cloth, it's not about the red, white, and blue, it's what it symbolizes. Because it, and it doesn't represent some physical thing, it represents you, it represents all of us, it represents a single unified people. We have fewer and fewer symbols that unite us, that bring us together, and we have more and more efforts to tear us apart. And that flag is one of those symbols that we all ought to be able to unite around and stand up for and say the Pledge of Allegiance to as one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. That flag represents the sacrifices, the blood, the sweat, the tears that have gone into making this nation what it is. I don't look at my ancestors with resentment and bitterness. I look at them with awe. Because I say they endured everything they endured because God had a plan for me. They were sowing seeds that I would get a chance to harvest. Whether your ancestors came 
from the potato famines of, of Ireland and came here to find signs posted in windows saying, no Irish need apply. Or they came here as Italians and found people treating them like they were outcasts and didn't want them around because, well, they don't speak our language and they don't understand our culture and they were invited to stay away and stay in your own enclave. Whether the Jews who came from Europe after pogroms came to this country and finally found the place where they could pursue education, no matter where you came from, the reality is that we're all here together now and we've inherited something greater than anybody imagined who went through all those terrible things. Now, finally, those who say, well, Bishop Jackson, you know, you're, you're okay, but you, you, you get into politics too much, and, and you, you just need to stay out of that. You know, remember that, that the Bible was written based upon a people for whom there was no separation between the sacred and the secular. No separation between governance and their faith, right? I mean, David was a king and a prophet. Do I have a witness? Amen. And so they have, a, they have this artificial sense that somehow bringing spirituality into the public square is some violation of American tradition. Quite the contrary. It's trying to keep faith out of the public square that is a violation of American tradition. We've always been a people of faith, a family, of freedom, and those two can't be separated. My brothers and sisters, it is faith in Jesus Christ that allows us to say, yes, the Muslim has the right to say what he thinks, even though I don't agree with it. The Buddhist has the right to say what he thinks, even though I don't agree with it. And I don't want the government telling him that he can't. But I will try to persuade him that there is only one name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. That is the name of Jesus Christ. That is your job and my job, not the government's job. We believe in freedom of conscience. And for those who want to be silent and say, stay out of it, I remind you of what happened to Eli as a result of his refusal to take a stand against his wicked sons who were polluting the temple of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 27 and 30 through 30, it says, the Lord said to Eli, did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? I hear God saying to us, did I not give you the freest country, the most prosperous country, the most blessed country on earth? Did I not give you freedom and hope and opportunity that the whole world looks upon with envy? I hear God asking us that same question. He said then to Eli, why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people? Therefore, the God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now, the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. I hear God asking the same question of Americans today, and particularly many who are in ministry today, and many churches across the country today, why do you honor your ministry more than me? Why do you honor your status more than me? Why do you honor your members more than me? Why do you honor money more than me? Why do you honor land and buildings more than me? Why do you honor the media more than me? Why do you honor your race more than me? For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. My brothers and sisters, there are those who are trying to turn race into an idolatry. So that that matters more. When I was in Boston, Massachusetts, I ran into a lot of conflicts with the nation of Islam because they had a lot of black ministers who would toe the line and go along with them. And, well, you know, Farrakhan may not be a Christian, but he's still a brother. And I would say he's not my brother. And they would say, see, 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 and then it was, Rev. Dan, but see, see, Reverend Jackson, Pastor Jackson, you were trying to divide the community. You, you, are not, you are not down with the struggle. And I would say, if you mean by that, 
I am not unified with evil, you are absolutely right. When they had the Million Man March, I was at C-SPAN speaking against the Million Man March. I think I got more hate mail for that one than I ever got in all my life. I was speaking against the Million Man March. Why aren't you as a black man going to the Million Man March? I say, I wouldn't follow Farrakhan across the street, let alone to Washington, D.C. And anything he's involved in, I'm not going to be a part of because he is, he is speaking out of evil and falsehood as a false prophet of God. I'm not following him. I said the same thing about Barack Obama. I don't care what the color of your skin is. If you are not following Jesus, I am not following you. Moses went down into Egypt and jumped right in the middle of politics and told Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. Samuel jumped right in the middle of politics and sold Saul. God has rejected you from being king because you're disobedient and you're rebellious and he's not going to let you be king anymore. He's found someone after his own heart to do that job. God had Nathan jump right in the middle of politics and go tell David about this man that has stolen one little ewe lamb from a poor man and he had plenty. And David said, who is that man? That man deserves to die. Nathan pointed and said, you, you are the man. And I can hear some people saying, Nathan, stay out of politics. <laughs> Elijah confronted Ahab and Jezebel and told them that they were troubling the land and that God was going to judge them for it. Elijah, don't get involved. That's not your role. My brothers and sisters, John the Baptist himself, he didn't have to say anything to Herod. He could have said, well, I'm not going to get involved in that because I, after all, I'm too busy preaching. But he called Herod out. And when Pilate confronted Jesus and said, are you a king? Jesus said, for this cause I came into the world that I might bear witness to the truth. And all who are of the truth hear my voice. He was saying to him, Pilate, even though I know you think you're important, if you don't hear my voice, you are not of the truth. And Pilate confirmed him when he said, well, what is truth? It's looking at you, dummy. We, we've, got, we've got to treasure the gifts that God has given us. And this country is one of those gifts. And then protect it. Protect it. How do we do that? And I'm going to close with this. Matthew 16, 6, Jesus said something to the disciples. He said, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now remember that they thought he was talking to them about food. So that tells you we're not, we're, we're not in that bad shape. They hadn't been born again yet. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. And they, they, were, they immediately went to the fleshly and the carnal. And Jesus basically rebuked them, said, I'm not talking about food, <laughs> physical food. He said, I'm talking about the teaching, the things that they are telling you, the things that they are trying to get you to do. Paul said it this way. You, you quoted it last night, um, Andrew, in, in Colossians chapter 2, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. My brothers and sisters, we have allowed philosophy and empty deceit to infect us. You all know I've just been reading this book called The Devil and Karl Marx by Paul Kangor. Some of you may have read it, but he talks about the explicit strategy by the Communist Party to infiltrate the church. A lot of people think, well, communism wants to destroy the, the church and destroy Christianity. Sure, but they want to take it over first. And they did it. And you know where they targeted their activity? The seminaries, or I like to call them cemeteries. Because they said, if we can get control of the seminaries and we can extract from them the power of this faith in God and in the word and turn them into kind of secular institutions, said so we, we can permeate them throughout the church and we'll take over from within. And they infiltrated Catholic seminaries and, 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 and Protestant seminaries of all races, all backgrounds. They sent people out into these places. That's how you get a senator like Raphael Warnick down in Georgia telling the church that we need to study Karl Marx in order to be better Christians. And also telling the church, I don't know whether you all heard his comment about Easter, he said, 
What transcends Easter and the resurrection is our doing good works. Just as lost as he can be and pastoring a church. Because that's what's happened. The World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, the Unitarian Church, which is not really a church because they don't believe in God anyway, but these all become hotbeds of Marxism. And my brothers and sisters, Marxism is what's invaded our schools because critical race theory is nothing but racial Marxism. Uh, the 1619 Project is nothing but racial Marxism because they know that class doesn't work in America because too many Americans start at the lower level of the rung and then through education and hard work become wealthy and affluent and successful. So they know they can't divide people as easily based on class, but if they can use race. Ah, a lot of emotional currency in that. And you can tell it's effective because when you've got a billionaire like LeBron James whining about how oppressed he is, <laughs> and you've got billionaires like Oprah Winfrey lecturing poor white students about how that, that person is privileged and Oprah is oppressed. <laughs> it is a form of Marxism for America that has worked. But we've got to reject it everywhere we find it. We've got to let the world know this is not, let the body of Christ particularly know this is not the teaching of God. That's, that's not God for us to be, God's will for us to be divided in that way. God doesn't want us looking at each other based on that. We've got to treasure this gift that God has given us, which includes people from every background. And may I just say as a footnote, I can't tell you how enriched I have been to see the beauty of so many other backgrounds. Do you know, American culture is unlike any other because we are an amalgam of so many. I wrote one time, this is probably the only place in the world where people whose descendants are come from Africa, they can go eat Chinese and Mexican food. They can attend uh, um, the, 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 uh, an Irish step dance show and, and, and experience just pretty much every culture on earth in some way amalgamated into America. People don't realize when they're eating hamburgers, they're eating German food. Or that when they're eating a hot dog, they're eating German food. Everything in our country is a kind of beautiful amalgam where God brought the, some of the very best from so many different cultures together to make us who we are. We enrich one another. We enhance one another. We help one another. We encourage one another. I, I, I've said many times, I, I know what the, the sentiment of black is beautiful was all about because people have been told that they were ugly and they were, they were unintelligent and all of that. But the reality is all of us are beautiful in the sight of God because he made all of us. And he made us black and white and yellow and brown and given us all kinds of differences to complement one another, not to divide against one another. The division is not the result of the difference. The division is a result of sin. And by the way, this notion that somehow Americans of European descent, if I may be, use their crude term, white people, are somehow the repository of all that is wrong in America. You know, that the, the school board in Loudoun County, Virginia, was discovered to be teaching, the, telling the teachers to teach their children to divide the world into oppressed and oppressors and to figure out which side of the scale they were on. And if you were white, you are an oppressor. Don't care how poor your family is, don't care what your struggles are, you are an oppressor. And if you are black, you are the oppressed. I don't care how wealthy your family is, I don't care how well educated they are. And get this, if you are Christian, you are an oppressor. Yeah, teaching children, Christians are oppressors. But if you're Muslim, you're Hindu, you're Buddhist, oh, you, then you are oppressed. See, they don't have the revelation. The real oppressor is the devil. The problem is not the skin. The problem, the problem is not the skin. The problem is the sin. The real oppressor is Satan. Satan is the one who is going around trying to put people in bondage. And he's used every people on the face of the earth to get that job done. 
It's time we freed ourselves from all this nonsense. Look, my brothers and sisters, I don't care where you come from. I don't care what you look like. If you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, if you believe that he rose on the third day to be your savior, to be your Lord, you are my brother. You are my sister in Christ. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is in all and over all and through all. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are one family in him. Hallelujah. For those whom he predestined, those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, shall he not also with him freely give us all things? I read the front of the book, the middle of the book, and the back of the book, and we win. We win. Victory in Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 I tell you, one other time Bishop Jackson was ministering and I said, man, I'm glad you said that. I said, because of the color of your skin, you can get by with stuff <laughs> that I can't get by with. And he says, you don't understand. <laughs> I tell you what, he gets more persecution lots of times than a white person saying those things because I tell you, there's a lot of prejudice by people of color. So... Anyway, I just appreciate this brother standing up and speaking the truth. What a blessing. Amen. Well, let's take a break. It's uh, 1035. Be back at five till. That'll give us a 20 minute break to take care of your business. Uh, remember that we have all of those materials out there. Bishop Jackson has a table and things out there. So please check that out and please try and come back so that it doesn't take 20 minutes to get everyone back. We'd appreciate it.
Okay, if we could get everyone to come back in and take their seat, we'd like to get started with the next session. Man, isn't that awesome what uh, Bishop Jackson is saying? That's just amazing. Praise God. And you know, one of the points that he was making is people say Christians shouldn't be getting involved in culture and speaking out on things and, and stuff and that that's not an American tradition. They don't understand history. This nation was started in the first great awakening, and I forget the exact number of times, but it's dozens and dozens of times that sermons are quoted or referred to in our Declaration and Independence. There wouldn't have been a United States of America if it hadn't have been for the godly people. There was a pastor named Peter Muhlenberg who got up and preached from Ecclesiastes 3, where it says there's a time for everything and a season for everything under heaven. And he read where there's a time for peace and a time for war. And he took his black robe off and underneath was a colonel uniform. And he says, now's a time of war. Who will join with me? And 60 people joined with him and went and formed a regiment. If you watch that show, The Patriot, 
um, that, that scene is in there. It's been changed some, but that's, that literally happened. And there's a statue to Peter Muhlenberg in the uh, Hall of Statues at the Capitol. So good things happening. All right, anyway, we're going to have a meeting about our Karius Bible College immediately after this. Deanne, would you come up here and real quickly give some instruction? Is Wanda here? She was here. She's out someplace else. All right, she's getting ready for the meeting. This is Deanne Gissel. Deanne went to our school and the original uh, couple that started it here in Phoenix, uh, the Shelleys, they left and were, did you take over from them? I did, and I was just telling that story. Oh, you were? Yeah. To whom? Uh, to the Pam, Miss Pam, right over here. We were talking about the meeting. So anyway, Deanne took over the school and just did a great job, and then we uh, turned it over to someone else. Was it Wanda, or was there somebody? So then we turned it over to Lisa McKay. Okay, Lisa McKay. And then, but anyway, she's now <laughs> a regional uh, CBC Whatever you are. Whatever. What are you? <laughs> Whatever I do. I'm over the stateside schools now. That's it. Yeah, so that's anyway, it. <laughs> she's going to help run this meeting talking about the schools. So tell them what, we, what we're going to do. Yes. So this is so exciting for me. I was just talking to Pam and I was telling her, it's so easy to promote a product that you believe in. You know, I am a product of going to Karis Bible College. And um, what we hear a lot is... Well, I feel like I'm too old to go. And um, so our youngest student was 17. And you upped me one time when I was saying our oldest student was 82. But we then. You graduated a lady who was 89. 89. So then I was like, well, then we had an 86 year old, but you still one upped me on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, um, Karis Bible College is amazing because the first year you're building your base. And then your second year, you're actually putting it into action. And um, I came into Karis Bible College having a good foundation because Andrew came to my church. That's how I knew who you were because your picture's in my church. And what so, church is that? Living Word Bible Church. Oh, good. That's yeah. Good. Tom and, and Right. And they come to this conference too. So I felt like I had a really good foundation. And then you go to school and you sit under the word, all those hours sitting under the word. And it's, I know it doesn't happen, but it feels like being born again again. <laughs> because it just brings to remembrance that foundation. And this is why we do what we do. And this is why we are who we are. And um, I always say this. The first year I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. My second year I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> And then my third year, I was like, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> so good. Speechless. <laughs> right. So we have a meeting right after this. And you go right out the doors and you go to your left. So the bathrooms are right here. And then right next to it is Sierra, the Sierra A and B. And um, we're going to keep you a very short amount of time. We know you want to eat lunch and get back to the conference. So we'll get you the information you need. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions. So please come join us. And like Andrew says, if you have it in your heart to go, it's not Satan. Amen. Amen. <laughs> How many of you are either Bible college graduates or current students? Could I have you stand if you are a CBC alumni or student? Wow, look at that. Man, that's awesome. So as you look around and see some of these people, just ask any of them, you know, was it a good experience? And I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who regrets going to Carrie. So please take advantage of that. I'm going to ask uh, our CEO, uh, Billy Epperhart, to come up and receive this morning's offering. Uh, I don't know how many of you know him, but Billy has been a godsend. Billy and Becky have been just awesome. And this last year, we had over a 20% growth in finances, and I think that was probably the lowest percentage. As far as calls, we've got, what, six... 178,000 calls last year. Uh, we had over a million contacts all together. I mean, it is amazing. And Billy's the guy that's sitting there steering the whole boat and I'm giving him directions from the back. <laughs> <laughs> 
but he's a blessing. I had one of the guys come up uh, during, uh, before the session started and said that he came to our business summit back a few years ago and he had nothing at that time and what God spoke to him and now in just two or three years, I think he's got 44 rental properties that he uses and God has caused him to prosper. And so Billy is really anointed in this area and um, he's also pastor to church. He's, he's a multi-talented guy and I just wanted to give him the opportunity to uh, receive the offering this morning. So this is Billy yeah. Epperhart. Thank you, Andrew. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm sure you're, everybody's awake after Bishop Jackson, right? You're good to go. I was walking in, uh, I went up to the room for a minute and came back and as I was coming back, I talked to one of our partner representatives and I thought this was an awesome report. We've, we've had 185 brand new partners during this conference alone. I think we ought to give the Lord a big hand for that. And, uh, you know, you know, being in the position I'm in, it's a, it's a very unique position, and I feel very honored to do it. And one of the reasons is it's because of Andrew and Jamie Womack and because of Andrew and Jamie. And I've never worked with anyone, and many of you have heard me say this, but it's absolutely true, that is more humble and authentic and real people than Andrew and Jamie Womack. And they're the most humble people in ministry, truthfully, that I have ever been around in my life. And one thing that I wanna tell you from my position because of who they are, not because of who I am, because of who they are, the, uh, the ministry is run with such a level of integrity that to the best that I know and I'm aware of, we don't have one penny that is wasted or goes somewhere that is not directed by the Holy Spirit. And so that doesn't mean that doesn't mean everything inside the ministry, you know, with everybody when you have 987 employees that everything is perfect, but we strive our best to be good stewards with what God has entrusted us with. So the first thing I want to say as I receive the offering today is is the, the first thing is I really want to encourage you uh, if you're not, to be a partner with a ministry here and with Andrew and Jamie. And we want to encourage you to do that because I believe, and Bishop Jackson said it much better than I can, but I genuinely believe that when you sow and you connect yourself spiritually to the right places, when you do that, that same anointing and that the, the same unction that allows Andrew and Jamie to do what God has called them to do, that'll come on you in whatever expression or whatever place the Holy Spirit has put you in to prosper and be blessed. And since Becky and I have become partners here quite a few years ago now, but in becoming partners, we've seen an acceleration uh, in our own wealth and what we do. And so I just want to encourage you, number one, to be a partner. And then number two, as we receive the offering today, to become a partner. Number two, I just want to encourage you in this, and I have a scripture that I want to read. Uh, this is one I read. I'm not going to take long to teach or anything. I'm just going to share this with you quickly. The one that most of us already know by heart, and I'll read it just from the New King James Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Then skipping down quickly to verse 10, it says, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So there's two things that I want to get to you. One is when you partner, you connect to that anointing and you connect to that ability uh, to be expressed in the way. And I, I love what Bishop Jackson said. I don't know if any of you heard him say it, but he said, we need a theology of place. Did you hear that? We need a theology of place. And you say, well, what, what does that have to do with the offering, what I'm doing? Because... Andrew and Jamie's place is here doing what they do, what God has called them to do, Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College, but God's no respecter of persons. If he has a place for them, he has a place for you. Now, when you give and when you sow, one of the things I've learned in my walk with the Lord and I've learned in business is this, is that many Christians love Jesus, they love God, they love the word, and they love to give. Right? They love to give. And so they will give, instead of giving or sowing sparingly, they sow bountifully. 
but I'm convinced now, and I've seen it happen in my own life, that sometimes we have obstacles or strongholds sometimes that the enemy will use where we do not stretch out our hand to really receive and are able to reap abundantly in what God has for us. So the word that I like to use quickly here is stronghold. In other words, many times uh, when it comes to people in their sowing and in their reaping, there are, there, Satan will put strongholds there to prevent you from financially walking in the blessing that God has already ordained for you and you have to take steps of faith to overcome it. Now, I, I can remember back as a young person the first time that I ever remember I ever gave a check for $100. How many of you can remember that? You ever gave a check for $100? And then all of a sudden you grow and, uh, and you know, you begin to grow and expand and you give a check for $1,000. Well, sometimes when you write that first one or two checks like that the first time, I mean, your hand is kind of shaking because what's happening is, is you're stretching beyond what your comfort zone is. Now, I'm going somewhere. You think you know where I'm going, but you don't, not yet. So you stretch beyond where your comfort is, and what that does is that breaks the stronghold. It begins to break a stronghold in your giving. But people also have strongholds in the area of their receiving. Well, as Andrew says, it's getting quiet in this Presbyterian church. They, they have a stronghold in their receiving. And so when it comes to receiving, uh, sometimes I'm convinced the Holy Spirit brings things to your life, brings people, I call it divine connections, just like Andrew was talking about uh, the, the man, I saw him walk in a while ago, I think it was David Lee, wherever David is. And I remember the first time we ever talked about this part of it, he heard me, some, I think in the business summit, and we talked about this part. Today he has 44 rental properties that he has today, and when he started just a few years ago, he had nothing. Well, what happens is, is the reaping of what God does for your life is you have to be willing in the same way it was a stretch to write the first $100 check or the way it's a stretch to write the first $1,000 check, God has to move you into a theology of place, Bishop, has to move you into your land where the blessing of God and the anointing of God on you in your finances can come. And so when I, when I get up and talk like this, I want to encourage you just to give and be a partner. But the second thing I want to encourage you in is don't allow strongholds to prevent you from moving out into where God wants you to go because we will always retreat in our life if we allow our flesh to dominate. We will always retreat to what is comfortable and familiar, which then will keep us from receiving the abundant blessing that God has for us because the Bible says if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. And so it's the reaping of the bountiful that keeps many people back. They're, they're willing to sow. They're willing to do, you know, those, those $100, $1,000, $10,000. But then you got to believe that God is going to cause you to reap. And real reaping, real reaping is going to come when you're willing to stretch and get into places that are not familiar and not comfortable. Now, I'm not advising you by any means to do stuff that's not smart, but it's amazing how Satan will keep us in our little spot and God's always got a much bigger spot for us. And so today as we pray and we receive this offering, I want to encourage you in the area of partnership uh, with the ministry here because just that partnership with this anointing and that partnership of how, of how this ministry is touching people around the world, just that alone as you connect to that anointing will bring blessing and increase to your life. But then the second thing is for you to learn how to reap in what you have, you have to be willing for the Lord to bring you into a place where it, that is bountiful for you. I call it the theology of place. When God blessed Israel, he brought them into their own land. And God's no respecter of persons. He wants you to have your own land. And sometime going into that land, there's some Jerichos, there's some walled cities, there's some giants, there's some places that may be uncomfortable to you. You say, I don't know how we can, uh, you know, how we can overcome, how we can do it. You're listening to the 10 Spies Network because it's the 10 Spies that came back and said we couldn't. But two, 
Caleb and Joshua said, we're well able. And you need to walk, you and I both need to walk under that Caleb and Joshua anointing when it comes to going into our own land that we're well able to go in and possess what God has for us. So if God is no respecter of person, if he's got a land for Andrew and Jamie, he's got a land for Bishop Jackson, he's got a land for Billy Epperhart, he's got a land for you. Hallelujah. So let's pray today over the offering and we're gonna believe God together. So take your offering. I think the envelopes have gone out. We'll ask the ushers to come and let's pray. Father, right now, we thank you for your blessing. And Father, I speak increase and abundance today over your people. I know there's people here today right now that are stretching and stepping into their own land and their own place. So we speak that blessing and increase over them. Father, we thank you for those that are partnering today with this ministry. We thank you that your increase is over their life and those that are now stepping into their own land where they'll reap bountifully and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So I also want to thank all of you who've partnered with us and given, and it's just phenomenal. You know, during 2020, during all the COVID stuff, it was the largest income we'd ever had. And then during 2021, that was the largest income we'd ever had. And already this month, we're, all, we're I think, 10% above where we were last year. It's just phenomenal. You guys are awesome. I tell you, it's great. Well, let's welcome back W.E.W. E. Jackson as he comes to minister to us. I know that y'all are being blessed. If we could just get this guy to get a little excited, <laughs> he would be awesome. Amen. Love you, brother. Praise God. Thank you so much, Andrew. Praise God. Thank you all for praying with me and praying for me and really appreciate being with you today. And it is so good to see so many people here free. That means all the COVID hysteria has not gotten into your spirit. There's a spirit of fear in this nation today that is unreal. People are afraid to move. They're afraid to do anything. And, and we know, look, God's got us. God's taking care of us. God's going to protect us. Amen, amen, amen. Don't, don't buy into it because frankly, it's not what I'm preaching about in, the, in a minute, but frankly, this thing is being used as an excuse to tyrannize the American people and to rob us of freedoms that are inherent and God-given and to turn us, frankly, I put it this way, to me, it's a dress rehearsal for the Antichrist. Getting people ready to obey, getting people ready to apply, apply, uh, uh, comply, getting people ready to just be trackable. You know, called, have, get called up on the telephone. Uh, uh, where were you and who were you with and who did you? I mean, what? This is, this, is, this is unreal. And we rebuke this in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over the United States of America. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, let me get to my assignment and, and give everybody a chance to go get some physical food as well as the spiritual food that you are imbibing while we are here today. I want to go to Isaiah chapter 6. Verse 8, and you know that entire passage. It's very familiar to almost all Christians. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. Above it was the seraphim. Each one had six wings. Two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, two he flung. And one cried unto another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I want to go to the eighth verse. It says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Praise God. Now, a few moments ago, I talked about what will you do with the gift? Before that, we talked about the fact that we are the remnant. And now I want to talk to you from this subject, answer the call. 
You know that we are the remnant. You know God has given you a gift or gifts. Answer the call. And you know, in my spirit right now, I just sense that there are those of you in this room consistent with what you were just saying, Billy, whom God is calling. And as Andrew said, I think last night, it's not the devil trying to get you to do something for God. But you know, we, we, we come up with excuses and we come up with, well, I'm not quite sure. And I, you know, that may not, this may not be, but you know, God really does call us out of our comfort zone. He really does call us out of the realm where it's all about us into the realm where it's all about him. You know, I, I shared with Andrew and Jamie, I, and God's been dealing with me and my wife about giving. And so, you know, he said, I, you, you, need to, you need to up, up your, your giving. And I said, well, yes, Lord. And we started giving and, and you know, we, we've been blessed and, you know, we're not, we're not broke or impoverished, but I finally saw the savings getting down to a kind of imaginary line that I had. I didn't even know I had it. And when I saw it get there, I thought, well, maybe it's time to slow down a little bit now. And God said, no, that's the time to speed up. <laughs> that's the time to thrust, cause thr cross that threshold because I realized I was really relying upon me and upon money as long, I, but I didn't see that until it got to a point where I was getting to my, past my comfort zone. Because, you know, the Lord said this to me one time in our giving. I, you know, we were, we were praying about, oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for making us givers. And the Lord said to me, but it doesn't really cost you anything, does it? In other words, God was ministering to me. It didn't, I, we felt absolutely no inconvenience. <laughs> No, it, it, we didn't miss anything. And you know, that's true, not just in the financial realm, but it's true in life, isn't it? As Christians, God wants us to get past the point where we are depending upon our own resources because your own resources will always limit you. Take the limits off of God. Your, re, your own resources will always limit you, but God's resources never run out. So I just would encourage you Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me, answer the call. All right, now we've learned that we're not here by accident. We've learned that God has called us and appointed us to this time, the theology of place. God has called us and appointed us to this time and if he's called you and appointed you, then he's anointed you with what you need to deal with the challenges you face. You know, I often reflect back on, on our history because I'm a student of history and reflect back on what people in prior generations had to deal with. And we didn't. And in some ways it was so much harder for them. But you know, we faced challenges that they couldn't even have understood because it just wasn't part of their world. In the same way they face challenges that we can hear about, read about, but we don't really understand because we simply weren't there in that time. But we face challenges right here in this time that God knew we would face. I said uh, earlier that if he prepared works for you beforehand, he prepared where those works would take place and the time those works would take place. So answering the call really means stepping in to what God has already prepared and given to you to deal with whatever you face in this life. Now Jesus, of course, is the preeminent example to us. He began his ministry down in Lazarus. We read the words that he spoke in Isaiah 61 when he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to appoint unto all those who mourn, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Now that's his ministry. That's what he's going to do. 
But then notice something. The script gets flipped in the fourth verse. He says, and they, meaning what? Those trees of righteousness that he is going to raise up and give the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, those trees of righteousness shall rebuild the old ruins. Those trees of righteousness shall raise up the former desolations. Those trees of righteousness shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Saints, that's us. That's us. Jesus announces his own ministry and then immediately puts the onus on us for things that are going to, be need, going to need to be done under his anointing. You can't do it without him. You know that old saying, without you, he won't. Without him, you can't. So he puts it on us to get some things done. So we've got some rebuilding to do. And we've got some raising up to do. We've got some repairing to do. And I'll tell you one of the most neglected aspects of our culture, and we in the church need to jump headlong into this. And I don't hear it talked about by our government. I don't hear it talked about in the circles of social services at all. We've got to rebuild a family in this nation. We've got to rebuild a family. The greatest social problem in America is not race. And it's not poverty. Not that those things aren't looming large in the minds of many people, but the root of what they think those things are causing, the root of the problems is the breakdown of the family. Do you know that the data shows that any young person who will finish high school, learn a skill or go on to college, not have children before they get married, stay out of the criminal justice system, not doing things that get them involved with the police and the criminal justice system, and there's about a 99% chance they won't live in poverty if they just do those things. And it's true across the board. It doesn't make any difference what the color of their skin is. The family is critical to one's future. And of course, since God gave us the family, the devil has gone after it with everything he's got. His desire is to destroy it. It's not an accident that the end of the book of Malachi reads that God says, I will send them Elijah the prophet and he shall turn the hearts of children to their fathers and the hearts of fathers to their children unless they come, unless I come and smite the earth with a curse. I believe in the real Hebrew, what it's actually saying is, he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children lest the curse run rampant in the earth. And it's running rampant. It's running rampant right now. Fatherless homes, 20 million children in America live in fatherless homes today. And there are only 73 million children ages 17 and under in the whole country. That means more than one out of four children are raised in a single parent female-headed household. And, Lord, and God bless those women who are doing the best they can because often they're doing what they're doing because the men have abandoned them. And God bless them. And we need to pray for them. And many of them succeed against all the odds. Some of us may have come from those homes, succeed against the odds, but it's not God's best. It's God's best for there to be a woman and a man in the home who love one another, love those children, and are going to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fatherless homes produce 63% of youth suicides. 90% of all homeless and runaway children come from fatherless homes. 85% of children with behavioral and mental disorders come from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. 75% of adolescent drug addicts are from fatherless homes. 70% of juveniles in youth correctional facilities. 85% of all youth offenders who go on to adult prison. 80% of convicted rapists. 72% of adolescent murderers. Children from fatherless homes are five times more likely to commit suicide. 10 times more likely to abuse drugs, 20 times more likely to suffer mental illness, 20 times more likely to end up doing lengthy prison sentences, 
and 14 times more likely to commit murder than children from two parent families. Now I know that sounds like a lot of academic and statistical talk, but it's very real for me because I was one of those children raised in foster care. Now there was a mother and father in that home, but the foster father, God bless him, did his very best, but he was illiterate and was really not a, any major influence in my life. I felt in many ways like I was a parentless child because as I got older, my foster mother simply could not control me. I was angry, I was rebellious, and let me tell you something, I'm not giving anybody excuses because everybody's gotta make their own choices when they come to the age of of adulthood, when they come to the age of, of cognition, of awareness that they can make choices. But we gotta, we, somebody's gotta present the options. Somebody's gotta make clear that there are choices. And right now, I understand these young guys who are going crazy in the streets of the inner city. Can I just tell you, brothers and sisters, I, I can't tell you how much I admire law enforcement people. God bless them, God bless them. I mean, wow. Because I, I look at the job that they do and I look at the thankless task that it is and I think to myself, who wants to do that? There's gotta be a calling on your life of some kind. 99% of these officers do the right thing. They're trying to do a good job. And look, I've, got, I've had people write nasty letters to me because I've said this, now, I am, I am about to finish my, my seventh decade on the earth, and I've said, I've been driving all, since I was 16 years old and I got my license, I've been driving all that time, and to, as far as I know, I've been, you all heard the phrase, driving while black? <laughs> I have never had a negative interaction with a police officer, ever. I've never been called out of my name. I've never been disrespected. I've never been manhandled. I've never been treated any way other than professionally by any police officer. Now, I'm not saying nobody else has had that, that other, other people have not had bad experiences. I know it's possible. But now, now wait a minute. Somehow, uh, somewhere along the way, if, if the police officers and police forces of the country are racist, somewhere along the way, I would have experienced that. My son would have experienced that. The, the, the young black men in my church would have experienced that. But somebody needs to say, if you are respectful to a police officer and you don't give them a hard time, you are going to be treated likewise. <laughs> Instead of telling young people, they're the enemy, they're out to get you. Now, I, I, I said all that leading up to this. For the last years, particularly 2020, we were told police officers are racist, police officers are out to get minority people, and we got to defund the police, we got to dismantle the police, we got to get rid of the police. So we've seen massive retirements, we've seen layoffs, we've seen budget cuts, and you know what? We have seen more black people dying in the streets of our cities than we have seen in almost the last six decades. It, it is a plague. I said, well, if the police were the problem, why is it somehow that more black people are dying? And Black Lives Matter has nothing to say about this because they're not about black lives mattering, they're about Marxism mattering and they want to use race as a way of selling Marxism to the black community and to the country and you got these dumb sports teams and you got these stupid corporate people who are buying into this nonsense and don't realize they would be the first to go under a Marxist system. Two hundred and forty nine innocent black children murdered since the middle of 2020. And you know what? I'm not talking about young gangbangers. I'm not talking about people out there in the streets. I'm talking about people, young people, three, four, five years old, sleeping in their beds, playing in their yards, riding their bikes along the street and gunned down in the crossfire, shot down for nothing. And, and, and I've talked to some of these parents and they say, they go to Black Lives Matter and they tell them, that's not our issue. Well, I thought Black Lives Matter. I say, they ought to change the name to Black Lives Murdered because they've gotten a whole lot more black people murdered than they've gotten black people saved. Can I add one other thing since I'm at it? 
I, I, I do believe that George Floyd was mistreated. I do believe that that man sitting on his neck like that was wrong. But let me tell you something, saints. George Floyd is not Martin Luther King, and George Floyd is not some kind of civil rights icon. George Floyd was passing counterfeit paper. He was high on, on, on fentanyl and methamphetamines. George Floyd was a criminal. If George Floyd had been doing what he should have been doing, the incident would never have happened. Don't tell me you want to tear down a statue of George Washington and put up a statue of George Floyd. I'm not having it. Glory to God. Glory to God. You heard me tell the story. I was one of those kids lost in the street. And my father came into my life and changed my life. He changed my culture, if you will, because he gave me a whole new set of ideals and values to live by. He, he taught me that there was opportunity available to me and that it was up to me what I'd do with my life, that I wasn't at the mercy of anything or anybody. And that, that made all the difference. My brothers and sisters, we don't need a new government program. And I'll tell you what else, we don't need anybody telling us that a family can be two homosexual men or two lesbian women or three transgenders, one non-binary and five or six fluids because that's not a family as God ordained it. Somebody needs to tell the Supreme Court they got to answer to God too. And I don't care what the Supreme Court says. I don't care what Nancy Pelosi says or Chuck Schumer or anybody else says. A marriage is a union between one man and one woman in the sight of God. That's it. That's all. There are two genders, male and female. There are no more. Now, this breakdown of the family is not by accident. It's not something that just evolved. And by the way, may I just inform you, the lie that was told was, well, the reason why the black family's in trouble is because of slavery. Let me tell you something, the black family remained intact from 1865 when slavery ended after the Civil War all the way to 1965, 100 years. My grandfather was born into a two-parent monogamous family with my great-grandparents, Gabriel and Eliza Jackson, who raised all of his children. I found them in several census reports in Orange County, Virginia. They were one family. They were together until my great-grandfather died. And it wasn't until 1965 with the great society programs that came in and replaced manhood with government and replaced family with government subsidies and replaced the work ethic with some kind of reparations or handouts with, that rewarded women for not having men in the home that you could see the decline of the black family falling off like falling off a cliff. In 1950, only 13% of black children were born out of wedlock throughout this country. And now here we are in 2021, 80% of black children are born out of wedlock and being raised in single parent households. I said not even slavery was able to destroy the black family. It took a bunch of liberals in 1965 to get that done. And these Marxists, these leftists have been after the family from the very beginning. Look, Bill Ayers, who's one of the people who helped get Barack Obama's career started, was the person who coined the phrase, and some of you may have heard this, some of you may be old enough to remember it, but the phrase was, bring the revolution home, kill your parents. That was Bill Ayers. That was his slogan. One of Barack Obama's friends. And in 1919, going back that far, George Lukacs became deputy comm commissar for culture under the Communist Party in Hungary. And he introduced a program to separate children from their parents. And guess what the program was called? Sex education. That's right, sex education. 
He said the way to separate all of these Christian parents from their children is to teach their children a radical view of sex that includes anything goes, all kinds of promiscuity, and tell them that their parents are wrong and caught up in a bunch of empty traditions to believe that sex belongs in a marriage between a man and a woman. That was a plan that was launched in Hungary. And here we are, the plan's still working, and they're trying to work it in the United States of America. We don't need another government program. We don't need to redefine the family. We don't need to realign the family. What we need to do is hear what God said. Jesus said in the beginning, God made them male and female. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cling to his wife and they too shall become one flesh. That's it. That's enough. That ought to be what governs America. And if, I, if you don't mind my saying, the Supreme Court doesn't have the last word about what a marriage is. The American people can always amend the Constitution and define a marriage as a union between one man and one woman. And I really believe that's what we ought to do. Yeah. Glory to God. We need to rebuild the family. And then we got some raising up to do and we need to raise up the truth. You know, the Bible doesn't talk about God hating things a lot. But you know, one of the things the Bible is very clear about God hating is falsehood and lies. He hates falsehood. He hates lies. And by the way, the Bible teaches us that we likewise should love truth and hate falsehood. And this is where the world gets confused about us because we hate certain false ideas. They want to morph that into we hate people who believe those ideas. We don't hate the people, but we do hate the ideas. And the people sometimes get in the way and they get offended. I mean, it's like, you, you all know Smith Wigglesworth had a habit of slapping people. I'm not suggesting you try that. But he would hit people. They say he was going down a prayer line one time and this guy was laying out, had a doctor around him, had all kinds of tubes stuck in him. Smith Wigglesworth walked up to him, looked at him and hit him. Bam! And the guy fell out. <laughs> and the doctor said, you killed him, you killed him, you killed him. And Smith Wigglesworth said, he's healed, meaning he's healed. <laughs> he's healed and kept walking. And somebody said, Smith, why do you hit people like that? He said, I don't hit him. He said that I hit the devil. They're just in the way. So they think we're hitting them, we're hitting at the devil. They just happen to be in the way. Praise God. But, but we've got to raise up the truth because the devil is the father of lies. Psalm 119, 104 says, through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. And the 128th verse of that same Psalm says something similar. Therefore, all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right, I hate every false way. And my brothers and sisters, moral and cultural relativism is a lie. This idea that somehow you are racist if you don't believe that some cultures are better than others in helping people to be stable and productive and, uh, and, and, and uh, inventive and creative. You know, they, they would tell you, you know, America doesn't, like we, we, we don't want to teach that American culture is superior. Well, it is. You look at what is produced. Of course it's superior to many cultures. And look, even within our own country, we see subcultures that we know are negative and counterproductive. There is a sub, see, look, within every, even every ethnic group, there are cultures and, that are predominant and then there are subcultures. And this has been true for every group that's ever come to this country. And right now, there is a subculture in the American black community, a subculture that teaches children and teaches people all kinds of pathologies. Like, for example, I, there's a teacher in Virginia who's, who got into some controversy by saying, these ideas that you should sit up in school and pay attention and listen to the teacher and, 
and, and be on time with your homework. These are all white supremacist ideas. <laughs> what? Well, I guess my father was a white supremacist then. Because <laughs> that's what I better do. But, but they, 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 have, they have taken perverse ideas and they, well, that's just as valid as, some, as, as any other, no, it's not. It's counterproductive to the well-being of a human being. And so, for example, this cultural idea that persists, um, still persists among many, that if you are black and you speak proper English, you are acting white. If you do well in school, you are acting white. I mean, this is, this is devilish. It is intended to handicap people and keep them in a servile and subservient position. And by the way, that's not just been true in the black community. Other groups that have come to this country always have those enclaves that say, Who, are you trying to be an American? And, and, and some of their friends would say, yeah, exactly. That's why I'm here. I look, and, and, and by the way, just, just as a matter of context, I, I happen to believe that that Spanish and Italian, I love the romantic languages. I sometimes will, will watch uh, um, uh, subtitled movies because I love hearing the languages spoke. I think they're beautiful. But America is an English speaking nation and we gotta teach people to speak English. We're not bilingual, we're one American people and we gotta communicate with, uh, with, with each other with one language. That's not a matter of hating anybody. It's not a matter of denigrating anybody's language. In fact, I really, I, I'd love to learn to speak Spanish because I just love hearing it. But as an American people, divisions on the basis of language will cause divisions in other ways as well. Don't buy into the lie that to want everybody to speak a single language is somehow racist or, or anti-Hispanic. It's not. It's, it's, it's talking about, it's addressing the issue of what best brings about the well-being of a nation. We saw Canada almost have a civil war over whether they want to speak French or English. Do we want that here? And we've got people now who just believe that, you know, oh, you, you, oh he's one of those, he's one of those racists. He's talking about English only. Well, look, I don't care what language people want to speak. I mean, they speak anything, speak pig Latin if they want. But as an American people, we've got to emphasize our ability to communicate with one another and work with one another and cooperate with one another. That means when you come to this country, you learn to speak English so that you can be a part of American culture. There's no your truth and my truth. There's the truth. What is this? You know, this is, well, you, you, I, I'm so glad. You know, I heard the Vice President of the United States say among the many dumb things she said. <laughs> Lord have mercy on us, please Jesus. <laughs> this, this, this woman gets up and says some dumb stuff about the is, you know, Israel being an apartheid nation and they're oppressing and all. I, I mean, God gave Israel the land it belongs to them. That's the way it is. You don't have to like it, but read your Bible. And see, her answer was, I am so glad that you spoke your truth. Your truth needs to be heard. No, it doesn't. Because it's a lie. Your truth and my truth. No, there is the truth. And the word of God is true. See, all that stuff comes out of, out of, out of Marxism. And look, saints, this, this being enamored of lies, which is so prevalent today, so prevalent. I mean, does anybody doubt that it's a lie? You're going to tell an elementary school child, uh, Billy, you might be a girl inside a boy's body. What? Where's the science in that? We've heard, follow the science, follow the science, follow. Where's the science in that? It's a lie. Glory to God. And here again, I think this is training people to be ready to receive the Antichrist. Because 2 Thessalonians says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth 
that they might be saved. We're supposed to love the truth and hate lies. And I know it's not popular in today's pluralistic culture, but my brothers and sisters, Islam is a lie. It is based on an ancient cult started by a warrior who used it as a way to subjugate people. Christianity is the truth. It is based upon the word of God. And Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Marxism, communism, socialism, it is a lie. We got half of our millennials believing in a lie. We've got to tell them the truth because the truth is what makes people free. Not protests, not riots, not looting, but the truth is what sets people free. Hallelujah. We don't need black liberation theology. We need biblical theology. We need a biblical worldview. We need to see the world through the lens of the word of God. That's the most liberating force there is. And America's founded on truth. Our founding fathers didn't say we hold these opinions. They didn't say we hold these morally relativistic ideas, but we hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, if I could say it my way, we hold these truths to be so obvious that even a dummy should understand them. <laughs> Jesus said, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. My brothers and sisters, there's a reason why constitutions change throughout the world every 17 years. And the American Constitution has lasted almost a quarter of a millennium. It is not because we're inherently or genetically brilliant people. It is because it was founded on something deeper than the opinions and ideas of people. It was founded on true, self-evident truths. They said the Constitution was written to secure the blessing of liberty. Where do blessings come from? Almighty God. God is the one who gave us the blessings. They said the Constitution was written to secure those blessings and God has preserved that Constitution for all of these years because it's founded on a rock. And people say, well, Bishop Jackson, but the Constitution that you're talking about, that Constitution defined black people as three-fifths of a person. That's a lie. That's a lie. And you know, it's such a big lie that it just gives proof to the fact that Hitler knew what he was talking about. He said, just tell a lie, tell a big one. Because the bigger it is, the less people will question it. That's taught all over our country, and it's not true. The three-fifths clause of the Constitution was a compromise that was intended to stop the Southern slave master class from having more power in Congress because what the slave masters wanted was for each slave to be counted as a whole person for purposes of the congressional consensus or congressional census so they could have more congressmen in the South. And people want to turn that into defining human beings as three-fifths of a person. I mean, it's a great big old lie. The fact of the matter is that compromise was based upon the fact that there were Americans who didn't want the slaves counted at all, not because they didn't believe they were persons, but because they didn't want to put more power in the slave master class. Frederick Douglass read our Constitution and had been told that it was a racist document, and after having read it said, I find nothing in the Constitution that's racist. He said the Constitution is an illustrious document he said, and the only issue is adhering to it. My brothers and sisters, we've been lied to. And it's time for us to restore the truth and expose the lies. Let me finish up. And here's the last thing. Obviously, we've got to repair the faith. We've got to repair the faith. I told you this morning that communists made a conscious decision to infiltrate the church primarily through the seminaries by teaching people like Raphael Warnock and others 
that the word of God is not true. You know, Marx had a, had a statement. He said, we must ruthlessly criticize everything there is. And the seminaries became infected with what they call high criticism. And what the premise was, was that the Bible's not the truth or God's word. It's a piece of literature and it's got some truth in it, but it's up to us as human beings to figure out what that truth is and discard the rest. And so you got people being sent out into seminaries who don't even believe in the virgin birth. They don't believe that God came in the human flesh and that Jesus was God himself. They don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they're out teaching in these congregations and trying to undermine the truth of God's word and undermine the faith. The Bible says that we're supposed to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Now I know this is probably not happening in your church. The fact that you're here means you probably go to a church where the word of God is upheld, but 75% of the churches in America have rejected the word of God as absolutely and inherently true. 75%. We've got to restore the faith. We've got to bring the church back to being the church. And let me tell you something, the most powerful institution in this nation is not the Congress and is not the White House. It is the people of the living God filled with his spirit, full of the word of God, standing up for what is right and what is true. There's no force in, in hell that can stop us. Glory to God, glory to God. We've allowed ourselves to be divided by denomination. You know, there are actually preachers who from one domination, denomination won't go into the building of, the, of, the, of another denomination because they don't like their doctrine. And you know, look, I, I, I'm like Andrew and I think all of us are, I, I believe in everything the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches me that, that there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches me that it's manifesting with the witness of speaking in other tongues, that there are supernatural gifts that are manifest in us. Now there are dispensationalists and other denominations who will say, no, 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 no. That ended when the last apostle died. And of course, my first thing I say is, show me that in the Bible. But more importantly, I don't want to argue with you about that because you're not going to convince me. I've been speaking in tongues too long. I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost too long. And I may not convince you, but we ought to be able to unite around what we agree is true. And we ought to agree that there is one Lord, one faith and one baptism. We ought to be able to agree that there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. And that the day is coming when every eye will behold him and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We ought to be able to agree that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, that we sinners plunge beneath the flood and lose all our guilty stains. We ought to agree that salvation is through Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. And if we can agree on that, we ought to be able to come together around that. Allowing ourselves to be divided that way, wanting to argue with one another and fuss with one another over these issues when we ought to come together around the things that we can agree on. Hallelujah. And even worse, even more crazy is being divided according to race. Allowing ourselves to, to, to have a black church and a white church and a this church. Now look, I realize there are some churches that are homogeneous because of where they are. If you go to China, to the underground church, you are gonna find Chinese. <laughs> and if you go to Sub-Saharan Africa where Boko Haram is persecuting Christians and murdering them and torturing them and putting them in slavery. You go to one of those churches, you're going to find mainly Africans. But that's, that's the demographic reality. But we're not, we should be dividing from one another based on that. We shouldn't allow ourselves, I refuse to allow my church to be called a black church. I said, there's no such thing. There's only the church of Jesus Christ, the church of the kingdom of God and all are welcome and there, need, there is no skin color requirement. And my brothers, all of that is based upon the sinfulness of mankind, our unregenerate nature, because we don't see things as God sees them. And people, look, 
They have been doing this, human beings, throughout time immemorial. And you all know that before we began to travel around the world by ship, people divided by tribe. They divided by family. The last time I checked, the Hatfield and McCores, who killed about a hundred of each other, were all white. <laughs> and yet, it's, it's, it's not the skin color. That, that, that's just, people use that, but, but what the problem is, is the sinfulness of the human heart. I'm convinced of this. I may have shared this with you before. If God were to wave his hand over the whole earth right now and made every single person on earth exactly the same complexion and gave all of us exactly the same texture hair and he left one difference, some brown eyes, some hazel eyes, some green eyes, some blue eyes, some dark eyes, it wouldn't be long. Before the green eyed tribe would be getting together <laughs> and said, Did you see the way those hazel eyed people looked at us? <laughs> you know, they don't like us. And, no, yeah, that's right. We need to have the green eyed liberation movement. <laughs> because it's what we do as human beings. And they've been doing it all over the world. I mean, did anybody see Spartacus? Because if you saw Spartacus, I think you noticed that the slaves were all white like the Romans. It has nothing to do with skin color. That's just a convenient ploy that's been used to justify something that the whole world has been doing and now been used to define it as inherently based upon race. But it's not. My brothers and sisters, the antidote is not all these these, this division and critical race theory and Black Lives Matter and it's the 1619 Project. The antidote is Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the antidote because sin is the problem and he's the only answer. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Precious is that flow that makes me white as snow, no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's time for us to answer the call. And in order to answer the call, you all know what I'm talking about here, because you get it, but there are people all over our country who are just wearing the, the britches off their pants, going to church, and are not living for God. You know it and I know it. Answering the call means you gotta know that you know that you know that you know. Uh, Christianity is not about a religion, it's about a relationship. Amen. Hallelujah. And I came into that relationship with Jesus Christ on December 22nd of 1976. I talked about my father earlier. Well, my father was not a saved man when he took me to live with him, but he got saved late in life. He had drunk all his life. My father told me this story of how God took alcohol away from him. He had gone to God after he got saved and said, Lord, I can't stop drinking. I'm trying, but I, I can't. It had become a habit. He'd done it all his life. He said, and, and, and you pay folks who come from a certain denomination, don't get upset about this, but my father was a member of the church that dedicated me. It was a Baptist church in the community, and they used to have liquor parties after church. <laughs> and my father was ushering in the church and went to one of those liquor parties after church, and he had been asking God to take liquor away from him. He said he sat down at the table and they put a drink in front of him. He said he picked that drink up and put it to his lips. He said it was this lightning went down from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. He said, and in an instant he knew he would never take another drink. He pushed back from the table. They said, what's wrong? He said, I'm going. And my father never took another, God took it from him because Jesus Christ is able to heal us from everything that ails us. When my father got saved late in life, I was not saved. I was going to Harvard Law School. I'd gone back to stay for, with him for the summer while I worked at a law firm in Philadelphia. And before I left, my father said, hey, son, you know what I'm doing? Now, this man, I, I, my daddy went home to be with the Lord in 2002, but I love my daddy because I always knew he changed my, God used him to change my life. I knew that I was in Harvard Law School primarily because God used him to give me direction that I didn't have before. And so my father said to me, you know what I'm doing? I said, what, Dad? He said, I'm reading the Bible from cover to cover. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I've never done that before. He said, I'm enjoying it. And I thought to myself, okay, good for you. <laughs> but on the way home, because it was my daddy who said it, I got to thinking. And I said, you know, I'm a Harvard intellectual. I ought to start reading the Bible, too, because it might come up at cocktail parties. 
and between sips of white wine, I want to be able to comment intelligently on it. I'm serious. Now that's what I was thinking, but the Holy Ghost had something different in mind. And I went back home and began to read the Bible in September of 1976. And ladies, you'll understand this. I was one of those men, my wife would come home from church and I'd be sitting in the living room of our little apartment with my feet propped up on the table, a beer in my hand, and she'd walk in the door and I'd sneer at how much of my money you give that preacher today. And my wife would look at me, sweet thing, just shake her head and say, poor thing, demon possessed right up to the eyeballs. I mean... <laughs> I started reading the word of God and I came to David, a man's man, somebody that I could, I could admire. This was a fighter. This was a strong man. This is a man who run through a troop and leap over a wall. This is a man who ran toward Goliath when others were running away. And David would talk so tenderly about God. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I've looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you and thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied with mal and fatness. My mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I think of you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Because you have been my help, therefore under the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. And I didn't understand what was happening, but I knew later I was coming under conviction. And I began to pray my own little amateur prayer, and it, this was it. God, if you're real, show me what you showed him that made him talk about you like that. My wife would be in the supermarket, I'd be sitting in the car reading my law books, and it would come to mind, I would say, well, God, I'm waiting. And on December 22nd, 1976, it's an old sim hymn that says, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I woke up, I felt like I was sleeping six feet off my bed. God had entered that bedroom and I knew without a shadow of a doubt that God was real because he was there. I could not see him with my physical eyes, but I knew that God had entered that room as if I was saying, well, God, show me. And God stepped in and said, well, here I am. I, I felt like I climbed down off the bed. I went in and my wife was sweeping my son's room. I tapped my wife on the shoulder. I said, you know what? My wife looked up at me real sweet and said, what? I said, I think I'm saved. My wife said, what? I said, I don't know what's going on. I said, but God is working in my life. I said, where do you go to church? I want to go to church with you on Sunday. My wife took three steps back, looked me up and down, said, you ain't going with me. Called my mother-in-law and said, poor thing, Harvard Law School's too much for him. He had a nervous breakdown. He got up this morning talking about Jesus. But I hadn't lost my mind. I'd found it. I went to church by myself that Sunday, sat in the balcony of that church, and when the preacher gave the call to come and make a public profession of Christ, I ran to the altar and lay there and wept as the load of sin was lifted off of me. I found out that he's everything I've been looking for. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Gamola. He's our all in all. He's the doctor in the sick room. He's the lawyer in the courtroom. He's the friend to the friendless. He's the father to the fatherless. I don't care what you need. He's able to supply. I thank you, Lord, for saving me. That's why I do what I do. I don't do it for ego. I don't do it for money. I do it because the God I serve is able, is able. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To God be the glory for the things that he has done. With his love, he saved us. By his power, he raised us. To God be the glory for the things that he has done. Has he been good? Has he been kind? Has he been merciful? Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. I'm done. I'm done. Old Saul said, I went to the valley and I didn't go to stay. 
but my soul got happy and I stayed all day. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, my rock, Jesus, my joy, Jesus, my hope, Jesus, my everything, my all in all. He made a way out of no way. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to God. Go ahead and take it away, give him something to dance. Hallelujah. Well, if that doesn't light your fire, your wood is wet. I want to invite our prayer ministers to come down here. And if you're like EW is talking about, and if you don't know the Lord, man, you ought to run to the front and receive. If you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, man, if you need this fire on the inside of you, come down here and receive. You receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. If you need a healing, if there's anything else we can do, we are here to pray with you. So please come forward and receive. Remember that we've got our meeting about Karis Bible College immediately after this, maybe five, 10 minutes. And please take advantage of that. They will uh, let you go so that you can make it uh, to get something to eat and be back. And we'll be back at two o'clock. I'll be ministering at two o'clock. So go Go to the meeting, go get something to eat. Oh, it's 2.30. Excuse me. We'll give you 30 more minutes. But come back, man. I'm, I'm about fired up. We're ready to go. So God bless you. We'll see you here at 2.30.